May the Lord bless us in our service this morning. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. We pause for a moment of silent confession before our Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The intro it appointed for the baptism of our Lord is found on your bulletin insert.
together the collect for the day. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the baptism of our Lord is from Joshua chapter 3. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place 
and follow it. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest, the waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the sea of the Araba, the salt sea, were completely cut off, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. We rise to honor our Lord in the hearing of his gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in the third chapter of St. Matthew. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Here endeth the Gospel. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 191. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with our sermon hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, we have one of the most remarkable readings, I think, before us today in our Gospel lesson. The baptism of our Lord. There are at least three striking things said in this reading today that probably should puzzle you, but also provide tremendous comfort for you. In order to see that comfort, though, something that regrettably not many Christians see when they look to baptism, I need to start with this question. When we think of Christ's baptism, and when you think of your baptism, is it comforting to you? Is it a source of comfort and strength and joy and peace? Now, when I ask it that way, this is what I'm really getting at. Is baptism, and this is where, regrettably, so many Christians are confused, is baptism law or gospel? Is it law or gospel? Now, think about this. What is the law? The law is God's holy word where he tells you and me what to do and what not to do. So if it's law, then baptism is nothing more than something that I do for God. When I go forth loving and serving my neighbor, I do so according to God's holy word, according to his law. And I do the things that I do for someone. If it is gospel, the gospel is what God has done for you. And for me, the gospel is an incredible gift. There is nothing from you that God receives in order to bestow his wonderful gifts of forgiveness and life upon you. Think about your creation. I always think this is the best way to illustrate it. What did you do that God made you when he made you? Well, think about it. What did you do? You think, well, obviously I did nothing. I wasn't there to do anything until God made me there when he created me and gave me the gift of life. Yeah. The gospel, the good news, is the salvation that we have from God that he did for you by coming to you, by taking your sin, by going to the cross, bearing the wrath of that sin, rising again on the third day, bestowing upon you the gift of eternal life. You did nothing to earn it. You did nothing to merit it. And that is why it is gospel. Pure gift and good news. That's why it's comforting. So back to baptism. Is this baptism of Christ, is your baptism a comfort to you? Does it guide and direct you every day of your life? Do you rise in the morning as the catechism suggests to us, making the sign of the cross, remembering that you're a baptized child of God, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you go forth joyfully, living in the promise, in the gift of that baptism as a child of God, only to return at the end of the day making the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Luther, in the small catechism, suggests that you do that. He suggests to us that baptism is one of the most profound treasures and gifts that God bestows upon us. And it is. And we see this in our gospel lesson today. And I want to show this to you. And I want you to think about what Jesus is doing. And I want you to think about it in the same way that you think of the cross and what Christ does on the cross because Scripture, as I'll show you, connects these two things for us. And we are to go forth living in newness of life as a baptized child of God because of what happened on this day when Jesus went to the Jordan River. Well, our Gospel lesson is pretty short. And here Matthew records for us that Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. And John is not sure what to do with that request. 
Now think about what is John doing down there at the River Jordan? Well, he's telling people to repent. He's telling people to recognize their sin and to repent of that sin and be baptized for the forgiveness of that sin. And here comes Jesus, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here comes God in the flesh to John, who's down there at the river baptizing tax collectors, prostitutes, people like you and me down at the river. And there comes Jesus. And John is very much puzzled by this. This is, this is absolutely scandalous. Why is Jesus wishing to be baptized at the River Jordan where you find a bunch of sinners confessing their sins and being cleansed and washed of those sins? Well, that's a, that's a striking thing. And so John says, no, I, I don't think so. I need you to baptize me. That's what he says. And yet you come to me. Our king, our Lord, always takes the initiative. He doesn't wait for you because you'll never do anything. Stuck in your sin, you'll always look out for your own self-interest. That's what sin is. But it is our Lord who comes to us. Thanks be to God, he does this. He comes to you. And here, John says, you have come to me. And Jesus says, yes. And I have come to be baptized. Let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So here we have John baptizing sinners. And Jesus says, I wish to be baptized by you. Jesus is not a sinner. He's the only one who has lived on this earth without sin. And yet he wishes to be baptized. And now he tells us why. That all righteousness, all righteousness would be fulfilled. Now let's think about that. The word justification, I don't know if you know this or not, but the word justification means righteousness. It means declared righteous. If you could look at either the Greek or the Latin, you really could do this, both the noun for righteousness and the verb to be made or declared righteous, they look exactly the same. Unfortunately, our two words do not. So we have justification and we have righteousness, and they look like two different words, but they're not. Righteousness has to do with that which makes us right with God. Now, the Bible uses the word righteousness in two different ways, and it's very important to understand this. St. Paul says this on a number of occasions, but I want to read two of them to you. The first is from Philippians chapter 3. You know this chapter very well. Paul is being confrontational in a sense with those who are boasting in themselves. And this is where Paul says, now wait a minute. If anyone is able to boast, it would be me. And then he begins to list all of his credentials, who he is. But then he says this, he points everyone to Jesus. And St. Paul writes, beginning in uh, verse 8, he says, For his sake, for Jesus' sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. It's actually, it's, it's a bad word. It's in the Bible. It's in Greek. It's a terrible word. In order that I may gain Christ. So everything I've done, he says, means absolutely nothing. It's absolute rubbish that I may have everything in Christ. And now look at what he says. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Again, the law tells us what to do. And when you do the things of the law, you are right with God. You have a certain amount of righteousness. Every time you go forth and do a good work, every time you do that which God has called you to do, you indeed have worked a righteousness that belongs to you. But there's a problem with that righteousness. It's never perfect. And Paul goes on then to say, but that I would rather have 
which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now, this is really important to understand. The Bible recognizes that when we do things, we can say that indeed the things that we do according to God's word, the good works that we do, they are indeed righteous works. But Paul says this, all of that is rubbish. It's rubbish when it comes to salvation. All of that comes from the law and it's the things that we do. And it's never enough. But there's another righteousness, he says. That other righteousness is the righteousness that we have by faith. It's Christ's righteousness. His perfect righteousness. It is that righteousness that you are clothed with so that you can stand. And you will do this someday, dear friend. So that you can stand before God and you can say, See, I am right. I am righteous with you, not because of anything that I have done, not my righteousness, but Jesus' righteousness, which I have by faith. Okay, let's go back to the baptism a second. With that in mind, Jesus is saying that this baptism that he needs to receive, even though he has no sin to wash away, this baptism that he needs to receive is to fulfill all righteousness. Well, what righteousness are we talking about? Well, we're obviously talking about His righteousness. We're talking about the righteousness that we lay claim to by faith for our salvation. That this, Jesus says, begins here in holy baptism. As I stand in the place of sinners. Now, where else do we find Jesus in the place of sinners? Upon the cross. The one who knew no sin became sin for you and for me. And he went to the cross and he bore that sin, though he had no sin in himself. He bore your sin and my sin, the sin of the entire world he bore for our salvation. And here in baptism, Jesus stands in the place of sinners, becoming, in a sense, those sinners that they would have forgiveness. Now, let me read one more passage to you where Paul now takes this idea of righteousness and applies it to baptism. Elsewhere, Jesus talks about baptism how? Remember with Nicodemus? He tells Nicodemus that he must be born again. And he can be born again only by water and the Spirit. And only those who are born again will receive the kingdom of God. Well, in Titus chapter 3, St. Paul talks about that very thing. It's one of the most remarkable passages in all of Scripture, chapter 3, verse 4 and following. St. Paul writes, When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. It was His work and His gift. He saved us. Now listen to how Paul puts this not because of works done by us in righteousness. That's the righteousness, again, that we do according to the law when we do good works, which God commands us to do. But that, Paul said in Philippians, that amounts to nothing. That's rubbish. That will never save you. And here he says again the same thing. It is God who saves us, who comes to us, Saving us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration. By the washing of regeneration. You must be born again by water and the Spirit, Jesus says. And here we see that same thing. The washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified, being declared righteous by His grace, we might become heirs to the hope of eternal life. Back to the baptism. I hope you're beginning to see this. These are two remarkable things. First, Jesus shouldn't be there in the Jordan, but He is. He shouldn't be there on the cross, but He is. And he's in both places 
for you and for me. And he is there fulfilling all righteousness, bestowing upon you and upon me the most incredible gift of all, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of life itself, being clothed in his righteousness. John consents. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. Luther loves that phrase. The heavens were opened to him. Luther says, nowhere, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say, after this, the heavens were closed. No, no. When Jesus comes up out of those baptismal waters, the heavens are opened. You sort of got a glimpse of this in the Old Testament reading. Just imagine these Israelites. They've heard the stories. They've heard the stories of their parents and grandparents who were not able to enter into the promised land because they had murmured and they had turned away from God and so forth. But think about this. The travels of the Israelites are the travels of our own lives. It is God who delivered them from slavery in Egypt. God delivered you from the slavery of your sin. He did so by having them pass through the Red Sea, stopping the waters, something only God can do. So they pass through on dry ground. They pass through that Red Sea, just as you and I do, through holy baptism. And they came into the wilderness, the wilderness of life. You're in the wilderness of life right now. It's not easy. It's full of difficulty. It's full of disappointment. It's full of heartache. It's full of trial. It's full of temptation. But there you are in the wilderness. And you're awaiting what? Passing through the Jordan River. As those Israelites did to go into the promised land, so too you will one day pass into that promised land, a land that we glimpse now, just as Moses got a glimpse but wasn't able to go in, you too will go in one more time through the waters that are stopped into the promised land. The heavens were opened. Dear friends, this is why the baptism of Jesus and your baptism is so remarkable and so comforting. Do you see it? Can you see with the eyes of faith? The heavens are opened. They're open to you to you, a baptized child of God. Because there in the Jordan River, Jesus entered to take on your sin to fulfill righteousness, a sin that he took all the way to the cross and overcame. And he overcame that sin, and he overcame the devil, and he overcame death for you. I told you the Bible connects the cross and baptism and it does. In Romans 6, a passage that you all know very well if you've ever attended a Lutheran funeral. All Lutheran funerals begin with Romans 6. We name the person, the saint, who was baptized into Christ's death, as St. Paul writes in Romans 6, buried with him, and who rises again unto newness of life with him. You see, your baptism unites you to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as that divine name is placed upon you. It unites you to Christ and His salvation, the gift of eternal life that He bestows upon us. Dear friend, your sins are forgiven. The heavens are opened to you. We all are in the wilderness right now, but the heavens are opened. Eternal life awaits the promised land isn't so far away. Any time, dear friend, you find difficulty in the wilderness, whether you're comfortable doing this or not, I don't know. Some of you might not be. This is what I recommend. Make the sign of the cross. Many of you already do this during the liturgy or at Holy Communion. Make the sign of the cross and remind yourself that you are a baptized child of God that Jesus went into that Jordan River for you. He went to the cross for you. He rose again for you. He ascended into heaven 
for you. And he poured out his spirit upon you, kindling faith in your heart, strengthening that faith by his word, by the gift of his body and blood in the sacrament, sustaining you throughout your wilderness journey. Whatever the ups and downs, and we all know that there are numerous, there's more than we can imagine, but we can face them because of what happened on that day in the Jordan when Jesus went into the waters for you and for me. Baptism is pure gospel, the greatest gift that you and I could ever have. Because in that baptism, we have the gift of Christ. We have his righteousness. We have forgiveness. We have eternal life. May your baptism be a great comfort to you this day and every day. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of God pass us all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. your attendance in the red book at the end of the pew as we prepare our uh, the communion. In addition to the prayers listed in your bulletin, we'll be praying for Jimmy Mickelfelder, who's struggling with his COVID recovery. And we'll also pray for Judy for her recovery and healing. Let us rise. <clears throat> Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you have revealed your Son to us in the wondrous epiphany in the Jordan. So also you have revealed your name and blessing to us in holy baptism, declaring us your beloved heirs. Grant that we may daily die to sin and rise to newness of life, living with joy as your baptized children. Lord, in your mercy. Preserve your holy church here and scattered throughout the world. Give steadfast faith to all Christians by the preaching of your word and through the holy sacraments and send laborers into your harvest. Enliven the love of your saints to bear one another's burdens and to show mercy toward those outside of the church. Quicken us in the hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Preserve the family especially all Christian homes, turn husband and wife toward one another in love, equip fathers and mothers for their holy duty as teachers of the faith, 
and preserve all children in the saving faith and certain promises of their baptism unto life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, preserve our nation, its leaders, and those who serve for the good of our people and for their protection. Grant peace in our time, O Lord, for you alone fight for us. Lord, in your mercy, give comfort and relief to those who are sick, depressed, tired, confused, or in any need. We especially pray, dear Lord, for those who are struggling with COVID, especially our brother Jimmy. We pray for those who have endured a positive diagnosis and are facing those symptoms such as Judy, Lord. We pray that you would bring healing and peace to them. We also pray for Pam and Willard, Cindy, Terry, Marcia, Damon, Frida, Robert, Daryl. We pray for our homebound Linda and Francis and all whom we now name in our hearts. Watch over, we pray, all expectant mothers and their children, that they may have a safe delivery and be brought also to the life-giving waters of holy baptism in your name. Be near to those for whom death draws near. Bring comfort to them, Lord, we pray, that they may hear your Son's words of grace in their last hour and be confident in their baptism, where you named them your child. Lord, in your mercy. At your invitation, O Father, we come to your supper for rest. Preserve us from impenitence and unbelief. Cleanse us from our unrighteousness. And clothe us with the righteousness purchased with your Son's blood. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you manifested yourself with the Holy Spirit in the fullness of grace at the baptism of your dear Son, and with your voice directed us to him who has borne our sins, that we might receive grace and the remission of sins. Keep us, we beseech you, in the true faith, since we have been baptized in accordance with your command and the example of your dear Son. We pray you to strengthen our faith by your Holy Spirit. Lead us to everlasting life and salvation through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament found on page 194. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For at his baptism your voice from heaven revealed him as your beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him, confirming him to be the Christ. Therefore with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
our Lord and trusting in His promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us rise for the new Timidus.
us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We end with our final hymn of the morning. 